before we uh, talk more about the second derivative, uh, we've been talking about higher order derivatives, I want to go over a summary of uh, the use of the first derivative. Now, we haven't been using that terminology a lot, first derivative, but that's what we've been using when we found out uh, about using the derivative to interpret or uh, analyze the graph of a function. So the first thing I want you to uh, recall is that one way we use the first derivative is to find the intervals for which the function is increasing and for which it is decreasing. Remember when the first derivative is positive, then the original function is increasing, and when the first derivative is negative, the original function is decreasing. Uh, we can also use the first derivative to help find relative maximums and minimums. So let's uh, think about that. As I uh, just said, we can use, the, additionally, we can use the first derivative to find the relative maximums or the relative minimums of a function. And remember, those are called relative extrema when we don't know which specifically we're talking about. The relative extrema that can refer to either a maximum or a minimum. Now, uh, the way we use the first derivative to do this is called the first derivative test. And you recall the way this first derivative test works is that we find the critical numbers just like we do uh, when we're looking for where a function increases and decreases. And it's the, those critical numbers, in fact, that's a good point here, let's uh, set those critical numbers are the only places we can have a maximum or a minimum, and we look, we check on either side of the critical numbers to see whether we have a change in sign of the derivative, because that means a change in direction. And so where we have that change of sign, we know that we have a maximum or a minimum. And that test, again, is called the first derivative test. Uh, so let's, let's remember here, as I was saying, remember relative maximums and minimums, relative maximums and minimums can only occur at critical numbers of the first derivative. That's the only place they can occur, so that's the only places we have to look. Now remember, critical numbers are the values of x for which the first derivative is zero, or values of x where the first derivative is undefined. So that's what we're talking about when we talk about critical numbers. And the additional piece of information to remember here is critical numbers are the only places that relative maximums and minimums can occur, but critical numbers do not ensure a relative maximum or a minimum. They do not ensure. So that means only, even if we have a critical number, we don't know we have a maximum or a minimum. We have to test to find that out. Now, let, let me also remind you um, that we saw uh, near the, la uh, the end of the last section that we cannot, I'm saying you cannot determine whether a value is a maximum or a minimum just by the size. You cannot determine a relative maximum or a minimum, relative maximum or minimum, or minimum by comparing the functional values. I'm just reminding you of an example we saw. 
oops, the functional value, I'm sorry. Uh, let's recall the, the, the function that we looked at, and uh, this isn't so critical, I mean, it's such a big deal, but I'm just, as a reminder, uh, f of x equals x squared minus 2x plus 4 divided by x minus 2. And we, if you recall, and probably you don't until you see the picture, we found out that the critical numbers were uh, x equals 0 and x equals 4. And, uh, and then we could find out f of 0 was negative 2, and f of 4 is positive 6. Now remember, the critical numbers are the x values where the derivative is 0 or undefined, uh, and we, we ruled out x equal 2 because the function is not defined there. Uh, but any other than that, we found the two critical numbers where the derivative was, was uh, uh, 0, which meant we had horizontal tangent lines. And so we suspect that we have, we suspect that we have a critical, excuse me, a relative maximum or minimum when x is 0 and when x is 4. And the associated minimum or maximum would be the y value, f of 0 or f of 4, uh, f of 4. And when we look at these values, we might think that 6 is a maximum and negative 2 is a minimum, relative maximum or minimum. But if you recall what this graph looks like, I'll do a, a relatively quick sketch here. Uh, let's say up here, let's make this a 1, 2, 3. Let's make this where 6 is. Um, and there was a vertical asymptote. I'm just doing a quick sketch. And uh, suppose this is where uh, this is where 1 is right here. And we had a graph that looked something like this. Came up here, and, and that's where 1 is. Then it went like this. Okay. And on, on this side, it came here and did something that looked like that. Now, this point, okay, happened to have the coordinates. This particular point was when x was 4 and y was 6. See, that's the critical number 4 over here and the y value of 6 here. And this point happens to have the coordinates where x is 0 and y is negative 2. That's where negative 2 is. Okay, y is negative 2. And that was that point. But, of course, from the picture we can tell that uh, the point 4, 6 is a relative minimum point. That's a low place on that graph. And uh, 0, negative 2 is a relative maximum point. So 6 is a relative minimum. And negative 2 is actually a relative maximum. And it's relative to its position in the graph, not in the whole graph. So we can't make these decisions until we test. And the way we would find this out is that for the value negative 2, the y value of negative 2, we find out the graph is increasing and then decreases when we go past 0 for the critical point. And that told us that it was a maximum. Well, we'll... Uh, it, on the next page, I want to uh, talk about uh, something that we've done previously as well, and that's looking at a graph of the derivative to make some decisions about the function that that derivative came from. Uh, so uh, let's go to the next page, and uh, we'll discuss such a thing. Okay, here we see the graph of... Uh, the derivative of f. Okay, so what we're looking at is the derivative of the function f. That's what we're looking at. And uh, from that derivative, from that graph, we want to determine where the graph of f is increasing. This is an important idea, and we'll continue thinking about this in the future. So uh, considering part a above, uh, the, what are the things that we want to do? We want to find out where the function f is increasing and decreasing by looking at the graph of the derivative. And then we want to find out what the critical numbers of the derivative are and uh, use that information to decide what the relative maximums and minimum x values of the original function are. That is, uh, what x values will the original function have a relative maximum or a relative minimum? So the first idea about where f is increasing and decreasing the function f, remember f increases 
F increases when the derivative is uh, greater than zero. That's when F increases. And so we look at the graph and we want to know where the graph of F is greater than zero. And the greater than zero would mean positive. And so we see here that F prime of X is greater than zero when X is between what? Num number four, uh, four and five. For X values between four and five. So when we see the graph of F, we would expect it to be increasing from X equal four to X equal five. Okay. Now let's uh, look at the B part. We'll come back and we'll actually look at the graph, but understand that's how we're making that decision. Oh, I'm not ready for B part. When does the graph of the function F decrease? Well, it decreases whenever the derivative is negative, less than zero. And so we look at the graph of the derivative up there. Well, the derivative is less than zero when the graph is below the x-axis. Those are the y values. F prime of x represents a y value. And where the y values are less than zero is when we have y values, I mean x values, that are less than 4 and x values that are greater than 5. So we kind of think here is, okay, f prime of x is less than 0 when x is less than 4 and when x is greater than 5. And so when we look at the graph of f and look at the x values less than 4, we're going to expect, in other words, that would be on the interval from negative infinity to 4, and then on the interval from 5 to infinity. For those x values, we're expecting to see the graph of f decrease. We'll see that in a moment. Now, part b. I've gotten a bit of a hurry. Okay, critical numbers. Well, in the critical numbers of the derivative are this idea. Remember, that's when the derivative is either undefined or equal to zero. Now we see in this case the derivative is defined for every x value, so we're only concerned about when is the derivative zero. Well remember f prime of x represents a y value, and so f prime of x is zero when, as we look up here, when the derivative has an x-intercept. That is, that's when y is zero, when it crosses the x-axis. So here we see that we have a critical number of x equal 4 and x equal, uh, did I say 5 earlier? I apologize. Way up here, you're probably wondering, what is he talking about? Up here, this is, uh, uh, we see that the derivative is positive when x is between 4 and 6. And we see the derivative is negative when x is less than 4 and greater than 6, not 5. Sorry, I can't uh, read my own writing. Okay, and so this is a 6 as well. So our two critical numbers, that is when the derivative is crossing the x-axis, when the derivative has a value of 0, that's on the x-axis, those are the values x equal 4 and x equal 6. So our original function might have a maximum when x is equal to 4 or a minimum, and our, uh, or it might have a maximum or a minimum at x equals 6. Now, how do we decide that? There we have our critical numbers, okay, which will mean that the, uh, that the graph, because the derivative is zero, the graph of f is going to have a horizontal tangent line at those two x values. But the reason we're interested in those critical numbers is to find out where we might actually have relative maximums and minimums. Now, let's, let's just think about this for a moment, okay? For a relative maximum, for a relative maximum to occur, what we have to have is f of x changing, f, excuse me, not f of x, f prime of x changing from positive to negative. See, because we need a positive slope and then a negative slope so that we have a maximum value. So what we're looking for is a place where f prime of x 
starts out as positive because that means a positive slope when F is increasing and changes to where F prime of X is negative. That would mean the, we have a, when we have that change in the sign of the derivative, we have a change from increasing to decreasing here. And so that would be where a relative maximum would appear. Well, now let's look up at the graph. Okay, remember F prime of X is positive when we're above the X axis and F prime of X is negative when we're below the X axis. Where does this go from above to below? And it's at X equals six where that happens, isn't it? At X equals six. On the left side of x equals 6, the graph of f prime is above the x-axis, so f prime is positive. To the right side of x equals 6, uh, f prime of x is below the x-axis, so that means, uh, uh, in that case, it's negative. And so we have this change from the function of f, the f function f, changing from increasing to decreasing when we move past 6. Okay, so... We know that we actually have a relative maximum not uh, happen when x is 6. Now, on the other hand, for a relative minimum, for a relative minimum, that means we, are, we were going down and then we go up. And so that means our slopes are changing from negative to positive, our tangent line slopes. So that means we're looking for a place where the derivative changes from a negative value, because that's a negative slope, isn't it? And it changes to a positive value. Okay, that is the derivative is changing to positive. Well now, that means the derivative is being below the x-axis and changing to going above the x-axis. And that happens when x is equal to four, doesn't it? On the left side of four, the derivative is below the x-axis, hence negative. On the right side of 4, uh, the, the graph of f prime of x is above the x-axis, hence positive. So we expect to see a relative minimum at x equal 4. Well, let's see the graph. Of the derivative. Uh, and then we'll see that exactly what we've described is going to happen. Well, now you see the graph. In the, the Whoops. Uh, we did see the graph. Now we see the graph. And uh, we'll go over this uh, again here. That uh, remember when the, 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 this parabola is the graph of the derivative, the other function we see is the graph of the original function. And we decided that because the derivative was below the x-axis here, that meant the derivative was negative, which meant the original graph had to be decreasing. And that's what we see happening. I matched up these reds. And then we see that uh, uh, in this interval that the derivative is positive because the uh, values are above the, the x-axis. So here the derivative is positive which means the original function has to be increasing, and that's what we see here. And of course, these, this, in this position of the derivative graph, the derivative is negative. If the derivative is negative, that means the graph has, the original function has to be decreasing going down. Uh, so we don't look at the, the parabola to talk about whether it's increasing or decreasing, it's whether it's positive or negative, tells us the original function is increasing or decreasing. Now, if the value x equal 4, since that is a place where the derivative is 0, we're expecting a relative maximum or a minimum. And you can see we actually have a minimum. And the way we were to tell that it was a minimum is that we were the derivative changed derivative change from negative to positive, which meant it changed from decreasing to increasing, so we had to have a relative minimum. Now, here's another critical number. Uh, x equals 6, so that was potentially a place for a relative maximum or minimum. We see it's actually a maximum, and uh, we were able to tell it was a maximum because the derivative changed from being positive to negative as we move past 6. Well, if the derivative is positive, it means it's increasing. If the derivative is negative, it means the, graph, the original graph is decreasing, 
So we're changing from increasing to decreasing. That's the way we knew that we had a relative maximum. Pretty cool, huh? The next few pages, we're going to start discussing something called concavity. And um, we've been using the first derivative to find where a function increases and decreases and where we have maximums and minimums. We're going to use the second derivative, which is the derivative of the first, to discuss the concavity or find out the concavity of the graph of a function. So first let's understand a bit about concavity. I mean, what it means before we uh, worry about how we're going to find it. What is concavity? Well, let me start this way. When, when, we're looking, uh, when we're looking at a increasing part of the function, and I'm trying to point this out, when a function is increasing, it can look like this, so that's increasing, isn't it? Or it could look like this, and that's also increasing, but see they have a little different shape. One's cupped upward, and the other one is cupped downward, isn't it? Well, we call this concave up. And we call this concave down. And concave, oops, concave down. Concave up is like it can almost hold water, and concave down is like it would drop out water, would, water would drop out of it. Now, the issue here is both of these have, are increasing lines, but the way the graph looks is completely different because of the concavity. Now, on the other hand, if we had something that was decreasing, if we had a part of the graph that was decreasing, okay, well, that means it's going down. And we can go down in this fashion. That's going down, isn't it? Or we could go down in this fashion. That's also going down. But again, they have a different look. They're both going down, but they have a different look. And we'd like to be able to tell the difference. And this, again, has to do with concavity. This one is concave up, almost like it could hold water. And this is concave down, like there's no way that could hold water. So again, concavity describes the difference. Now, let me just make some quick sketches here, uh, separating what we're doing. And once again, just look at some ideas of concave up. I want to refer to them below a little bit more. So, for instance, something that looks like this is concave up. That clearly holds water. This is concave up. That doesn't quite hold water. And this is concave up. Okay, those are all examples of concave up. They're just kind of different levels of that concavity. Now, as we're going through here, I want you to, to imagine tangent lines. Um, and, and there's quite a bit to imagine here, but let's imagine a tangent line. So, for instance, the tangent line at this point just roughly is something that looks like that, isn't it? Now, here's the thing to notice about that tangent line. is below the graph. It's, it's underneath the graph, isn't it? If we look at the uh, tangent line on this portion over here in the, in the middle example, in this example again, if we drew that tangent line, then that tangent line is below the graph. Well, that's actually a feature of being concave up. When a part of the graph is concave up, if you draw a tangent line in any part of that graph, then the tangent line will fall below the graph. Now, on the other hand, with concave down, So some examples of concave down. Well, the, the most extreme of examples would be something like that. That's concave down. Of course, here's another example of concave down. And here even is an example of concave down. It's just we see less of it. But it's, they're all basically the same thing, aren't they? Now, when we have a part of a graph that's concave down, and on any part of the position where it's concave down, we draw a tangent line. We notice here the tangent line is above the graph. And you would see that that would be the case in the other two examples as well. Any tangent line you can imagine, tangent line there, a tangent line there, a tangent line there, 
all those positions of tangent lines, the tangent line would lie above the graph itself. So if I didn't draw a very good point, did I? The graph would be above, excuse me, the tangent line would be above the graph. So that's another, that's the idea once again, that when we have tangent, when we have concave down, tangent lines will appear above the graph. Now, <clears throat> let, let me, let me also, let, let's come back up here to where it says concave up. Uh, okay, look, look at, look at this first graph. And something I want you to notice as the, as the tangent lines move. And in, in fact, let me come back down here. Let, let's do the same thing. And, and I want to, whoops, I want to make a new starting point where we have concave up. Okay. Now, in, in this case, let me draw this. Let's just, I need something fairly big so I can, Kind of refer to it. Okay, now obviously this is someplace on an x-axis, I mean on a coordinate system. And uh, so if I choose a point on the graph, there's below it an associated x value. And I'm thinking of my x values, of course, getting bigger and bigger. But here's what I want to do. If we look at the tangent line that's associated with that point on the graph, then that tangent line certainly is a negative has a negative slope, so it's a negative number. And because it's so steep going downward, it's a pretty big negative number, isn't it? Pretty big, like maybe a negative three or a negative four. It's probably not quite that much, but it, it's pretty steep. And so the negative is fairly is a fairly big negative number, meaning it's uh, a big number and negative. Now, let's move further along this curve and so we're at this point. Now when we draw the tangent line there, okay, now that tangent line is also has a negative slope, but it's not as negative. So the slope actually got bigger, okay? For instance, the first tangent line might be a slope of negative four. The second tangent line might be a slope of negative one. So the slope of the tangent line got bigger. Now on the other hand, if we move further along the graph to right here, then we would see, oh, okay, now we have a tangent line that has a positive slope. So it got yet bigger. This, this slope is bigger than the previous two slopes. And we move further along the graph and draw the tangent line. Well, now that's also positive. But this tangent line is more steep than the previous tangent line. So its slope number is bigger yet. And so what we see happening is the slopes are increasing. See, the slopes of the tangent lines are getting bigger. That means the derivative, okay, the derivative is increasing. That's important. So when we have concave up, we have a situation where the slopes of the tangent lines are getting larger, which means the derivative is increasing. Now, same idea, and we'll kind of rush through this a little bit more quickly now. When we're talking about concave down, so we're talking about something that looks like this. Now, if I pick a position on that graph here and look at the tangent line, well, that's a pretty big, uh, that's a positive slope tangent line, and so it's a pretty big positive number. But if I move further along on this graph and look at the slope of that tangent line, well, that's still positive, but it's a smaller positive number because it's not as steep. Uh, of course, I move further along, and I'm actually going to get over here where now my uh, tangent line has a negative slope. And I move further along. This tangent line also has a negative slope, but it's steeper, so it's a smaller number. So we see the slopes of these tangent lines are decreasing from big positive to small positive to small negative to big negative. So a feature of being concave down is since the tangent line slopes are getting smaller, that means the derivative is decreasing. Now, I'm, I'm going to say this and then I'm going to summarize it on the next page. But 
how do we tell when a function let's forget that we have let's forget that we have a derivative here but if we just are given a function g how do we tell when a function you know g is increasing and how do we tell how do we know when g is increasing well, what do we do we look at the derivative don't we g increases whoops g increases when its derivative let me write it this way in fact when the derivative of g and that's what we call g prime isn't it see that's g prime when the derivative is positive that's how we tell when a function is increasing so i'm asking the question then how could we tell where f prime of x is increasing how can we tell when it's increasing? Well, we can tell it's increasing when its derivative, see, the derivative of the function, we want to know where the derivative, where the f prime of x function is increasing. Well, we can tell that when the derivative is positive. Well, here's the issue then. The derivative of f prime of x is what? That's nothing more than the second derivative. Okay, now let me say this again. We want to know when f prime of x is increasing. And so that's just the function we want to know about when it's increasing. Well, the way we tell a function is increasing is we look at the derivative of that function. So now we're looking at the derivative of f prime because we want to know when f prime is increasing. And when the derivative of the function is positive, that means the function, in this case, f prime, is increasing. And the derivative of f prime, once again, is f double prime. The derivative of f prime is the second derivative. So, and also then, we could use that same argument. I don't think I'll talk all the way through it. But of course, the second derivative is nothing more than the derivative of the first derivative, as we said before. And if, and if the derivative is negative, then what we know is that the function that the derivative came from is increasing. I mean, excuse me, is decreasing. See, that's the relationship. So to know whether the derivative is decreasing, we find out if where the second derivative is negative. And those are related to concave and con uh, up and concave down. Uh, let, let me go on to the next page and, and summarize this a bit uh, and to get really what we're after finally here. Okay, we, we've gone through the discussion, and I know it's something that's, that's uh, not going to be easy to follow through on that every time. I hope you understood what I was saying. Um, but let's summarize the important items here, okay? The important items. Well, first off, when we're talking about concave up, one of the things that we need to know is the tangent lines are lie below the act the graph. Tangent lines uh, lie below the graph when we have concave up. Now, something that we said about that is that when we have concave up the slopes of the tangent lines are increasing. And, and then I tried to put together what that means. And, and uh, so and that was the discussion before, which means that uh, f prime of x is increasing. Okay, the, the slopes are increasing, so f prime of x is increasing. Well, that further tells us then the derivative of f prime of x has to be greater than zero, has to be positive. And that implies then this, because the derivative of f prime of x 
is f double prime of x. And so that means f double prime of x has to be greater than zero. So the big summary of this part right here is that if we can find out where f double prime of x is greater than zero, then that is exactly where the function f is concave up. Second derivative positive means concave up. Second derivative positive means concave up. That's really the bottom line there. And in a similar fashion, uh, let's discuss real quickly concave down. It's kind of a repeat of what we said, but uh, we're looking for a bottom, uh, a, a bottom conclusion. When we're concave down, then tangent lines on the graph lie uh, above the graph. Tangent lines lie above the graph. And what else do we know? The slopes of those tangent lines, slopes are decreasing. Are decreasing, which means f prime of x is decreasing. Okay, so the significance there is for f prime of x to be decreasing, f prime of x is decreasing when the derivative. Whenever a function is decreasing is when the derivative of the function is, is less than zero. So f prime of x is decreasing when its derivative is zero. Uh, less than zero, pardon me. When its derivative, the derivative of f prime of x is less than zero. That's how we know when a function is decreasing. But the derivative of f prime of x is f double prime. So this is really telling us the second derivative is less than zero. So let's sum this up here, because this is really the important line. That says, that's telling us that whenever the second derivative is less than zero, then that's how we know that the function itself is concave down. So we're looking where derivative is less than, second derivative is less than zero, then we know about the function being concave down. Now, what I, what I want to do at this point is put the original two functions back up here and uh, uh, point out to you, let's, let's, I'm going to put them right below uh, here in a moment, but as, as I do that, I, I want you to be thinking about this. Uh, as we just said here. We're going to look at the graph. We're going to have the graph of f of x, okay, the graph of f prime of x, and the graph of f double prime of x. And, and we're going to look to see where f prime of x is negative and where f prime of x is positive. Because remember, I mean double prime. When f double prime of x is negative, then f will be what? Concave what? Concave down. And when f double prime of x is positive, then that will mean f is concave up. Now, if we're looking at a graph of f double prime of x being less than zero would mean the graph is below the x-axis and being greater than zero would mean the graph is above the x-axis. So, uh, that's what we'll look at here right uh, right now. Okay, here we see the graph of, the blue graph is the original function f, the red graph is the derivative of f, and the green graph is the double, the second derivative of f. Uh, and and uh, the, the red graph and the blue graph we saw earlier uh, in color coding. Now, what I'd like you to recognize here, this is the discussion we had a little earlier, that because the green graph is the derivative of the red graph, happens to be the second derivative, but it's the derivative of the derivative. Wherever the green graph is above the x-axis, then the uh, what it is the derivative of, the first derivative, is increasing. 
see so the green graph is above the x-axis uh, from negative infinity to 5 and of course then that means the derivative is increasing and then when the green graph uh, is below the x-axis that's from 5 to infinity then the red graph is decreasing uh, but the way this fits in with uh, our discussion earlier is when we want to know uh, we want to know when the blue graph, the graph of f, is concave up based on uh, the second derivative. And notice here at x equal 5, okay, and notice on the blue graph at x equal 5, to the left of 5, x equal 5, the blue graph is concave up. And that's because the second derivative, the green graph, the second derivative is greater than zero. It's above the axis. Now, whenever the second derivative gets less than zero, that's below the axis, and that's for x is 5 and bigger. And if we look on the part of the graph where x is 5 and bigger, we're concave down. So that is when the second derivative is negative, the, gra the original graph is concave down. We're seeing evidence of that uh, in, in this illustration of these graphs. Well, now it's time for us to move on to uh, uh, to close out this section. Now, um, we we saw a graph there just a second ago uh, on a previous page where we had part of the graph concave up and part of the graph concave down. You know, in, in, in fact, just do a real quick sketch here. Suppose we have a graph that looks something like this, and, then, and I'm not trying to be exact at all, but um, something like this. Comes along, does like this, and then it starts coming down, and then it turns around and starts going back up, something like that. Now, here's the, the issue. We can see part of this graph is concave down, and part of this graph is concave up. I mean, it, it's not any no question to us at all. For instance, that uh, somewhere right here, see here we have a tangent line that is above the axis, so that means we're concave down. I mean, above the graph, so we're concave down. But it's clear that in that part of the graph, water would fall out of it. There's no way, so we understand that idea of concave down. Now, if we come over here for instance, uh, in this area, so we're kind of ignoring the rest of the graph, but we see here that the uh, tangent line is below the axis, so on this part, I mean, it's below the graph. So on this part of the graph, then, uh, then we're in a position that we are concave up in this part of the graph. Now, obviously, on the left side is concave down, and on the right side is concave up. Somewhere in between, somewhere it had to change concavity. And and maybe, and I'm just kind of sketching this in here, maybe that's at that point. See, maybe that's where it changed from being concave down to concave up. And, and if that's the case, that's where it changed, that's what we call an inflection point. An inflection point is a point on the graph where concavity changes. Now, here's something that's interesting about uh, inflection points. Besides just that's where the concavity changes. And it's going to be hard for me to draw here as, as rough as my sketch is. But at an inflection point, if you draw a uh, tangent line, what you're going to see is on one side of the tangent line, if you will, I'm kind of overemphasizing, on one side of the tangent, uh, on the inflection point, the tangent line lies above the graph. See, in this case, or, or below. And what, I, what it really boils down to at an inflection point the tangent line on one side is above or below, and on the other side, it's the opposite of that because we have a change in concavity there. And so roughly, that's what I've drawn here. We can see on the left side of the inflection point, the tangent line is above the graph, and on the right side of the inflection point, the tangent line is below the graph where we would be concave up. Now, this can only happen 
See, the, the only place critical numbers, I mean, excuse me, uh, concavity can change. Remember, concavity has to do with whether the second derivative is positive or negative. So if we're changing concavity, the second derivative is changing from positive to negative or negative to positive. And the only way it can change is if it was zero in between. So inflection points can, can only happen this kind of is a deja vu, but it's different. Can only happen at critical numbers. Critical numbers of the second derivative. Critical numbers, not of the first, but of the second derivative. Maximums and minimums and critical numbers of the first derivatives, critical numbers of the second derivative do not ensure points of inflection. It's the only place they might happen. That is, when the second derivative has a critical number, we might have a place where we change concavity, and then we might not. So we have to test, and we test kind of like we've tested in the past. So. Uh, critical numbers are the only place it can only happen at critical numbers of the second derivative, but critical numbers of the second derivative, okay, do not guarantee, do not ensure Do not, whoops, do not ensure points of inflection or inflection points. So we do not have to have a change in concavity, but that's the only place we can. So this gives us a plan kind of like what we were doing for uh, finding relative maximums and minimums, the way we find uh, uh, concavity and inflection points is we find critical numbers of the second derivative and then we look for changes in sign of the second derivative from positive to negative or negative to positive. And so uh, the next part of this is actually putting to use these ideas and answering questions about concavity and inflection points.